Well, welcome to the online service of Brookhaven Church. I'm so delighted that you have joined with us today. Uh, this is now our fifth uh, Sunday that we've been online only uh, during the month of July. And now the first Sunday of August, we've been meeting together online because we've had an increase of positive cases of the coronavirus uh, in our area and the surrounding areas. But the good news is that uh, in two weeks from today, we're going to begin meeting together in person as well as online again. So on August the 16th, we're going to have uh, our church begin to meet together again. And uh, we're going to have one service to begin with. We're going to do it at 10 o'clock beginning on Sunday morning, August the 16th. We're going to do service only. So we will have place for those of you who want to come and be in person. And then we will continue to do our online services for those of you who do not yet feel comfortable coming and gathering up in person. Uh, we're going to begin from August 16th through the first week of September. We're going to have that one service only. We're not going to have children's ministries. We're not going to have uh, on, we're not going to have the Bible studies meeting uh, in person. Just one service only. But then beginning on the Sunday after Labor Day, we're going to open back up together. We're going to have uh, two services. We're going to have our children's and youth areas open. We're going to have our Bible studies meeting in person. And uh, hopefully by then, we'll continue to see the cases of the coronavirus continuing to decrease. Uh, I was looking just a few minutes ago this week uh, here in McKinney uh, that we've had over 60 uh, cases less than we had uh, last week, positive uh, confirmed cases. So there is a trend that the positive cases are going down, not only in McKinney, but in the surrounding areas. And so that's good news. So it is our hope that they will continue to go down. And as they do over the next month, that uh, it will get safer and safer week by week for us to begin to gather together again. So we're looking forward to that. So remember, uh, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that, we'll begin meeting together again, both in person and online. Well, during this time that we have been uh, not meeting together and been online only, uh, we have seen the church continue to be the church, both taking care of each other, ministering uh, just to people uh, all around the world. And one of the things that, uh, that we did just three weeks ago, I presented to you a vision, a vision of touching the nation of Pakistan. And so we presented to you a ministry that we're working with there. And uh, through um, a, a brother that I introduced to you several weeks ago, uh, Dr. Falak Shur, uh, he has, um, leads the Hunuk ministry. And uh, there is a church there in uh, Sheikh Hapura. I can't hardly say it. Sheikh Hapura, uh, the, the, uh, the city there. And that's actually a whole district there uh, in that country and a nation that is 97% Islamic, uh, very little Christian, there is a thriving church there in that city. And you and I have been able to help them begin to meet together uh, in a tent. And so for $1,200 a month, we've been renting a tent and the church has been meeting together. You see some uh, pictures there on the slides and that was from last Sunday. And so just packed out. What a beautiful, beautiful sight. Uh, and then in addition to that, last week they baptized 11 people. So I just showed you a couple pictures there uh, for you to see. But uh, just a few weeks before that, they baptized 50 people. So you and I are able to help them by providing a place for them to meet temporarily in this tent. But Brother Falak uh, shared with us a vision of having a church building. A building where that church meeting in the tent could begin to meet in their own building and have services and reach out. And then in addition to that, the building would be used to educate children uh, ages 6 to 16 during the day. And then it would be like a Bible training center at night uh, for all the pastors in the area. They have about 100 pastors that work there with Hanuk Ministries. They could train them in the Word of God. Brother Falak shared with us it would take $72,000 to be able to build that, buy the land and build the building. $20,000 for the land, $5,000 to register it with the government, 
and then another 47,000 to build that incredible building that would minister to literally thousands of people. We shared that with you three weeks ago. And so today I would like to just give a praise and a shout out to the glory of God that as of this moment, we have taken in, our church has given $72,326. Unbelievable, amazing thing. So while you and I have not been meeting together, God has now worked through us that we might be able to provide a place for another church to meet all the way around the world. A church building that is going to impact that nation for Jesus Christ. What a miracle. $72,326 has come in in the last three weeks. That's above and beyond the regular gifts and tithes and offerings of our people. You all, that is a miracle. That is an astounding move of God for us and through us. And I am just so thrilled that my family and I have been able to have an opportunity to make an investment in that church, in that building. I believe that one day we're going to stand before God and there may literally be thousands of people who are going to be there because of what you and I have been able to do over the last three weeks. That is just an amazing privilege, an amazing move of God. I'm very, very excited about it. I just also just want to say there are probably some of you who are watching right now. You've had intentions to give. You've thought, I want to be a part of that, and you just hadn't gotten around to it yet. And maybe you're sitting there feeling like that you've missed out on an opportunity to be a part of something extraordinary. Well, I just want to give you some good news. They will still need some additional funds to be able to provide, uh, place, uh, provide furnishings for the building and all that it will be used for. So if you are watching and you would still like to be a, have the opportunity to participate in this extraordinary miracle and this extraordinary outreach that is going to be uh, just impactful for that whole area, if you'd like to do that, you can still give. So the way you can do that is you can go to brookhavenchurch.com slash give. And when you do that, you will come to the landing page there that will uh, enable you to give online. You'll see a little uh, slot there that says general. That means any money that you give uh, that way will go to our general fund and, and budget offerings. But if you click the little arrow beside the word gen general, it reveals a drop-down menu of different designated accounts you can give to. The second one there is Church in Pakistan. Just click on that, and then anything that you give, we will put toward this ministry, and you will still have the opportunity to invest in what God is doing in that land. And so glory to God, praise be to God. We thank Him so very much. And I just want to tell you how proud I am of you, and I'm so thrilled over what God has done through you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to just thank you also for your continued faithfulness and your regular offerings to our church. Thank you for your generosity. I ask you to still continue to go online and give there at brookhavenchurch.com slash give. And I, we appreciate that so very, very much. Would you bow with me? And I just want to say, let's pray together and praise God for this miracle, modern day miracle he has done in the last three weeks. Let's pray together. Father, I am so thankful that you've given us the privilege of being a part of what you're doing in Pakistan. Thank you that you are moving there in a powerful way, that people are coming to Christ there every week in that land that is dangerous, that land that is filled with darkness and, and false idols and those who worship things that, oh God, are not of you. And Lord, in the middle of that darkness, you have raised up a light in that community through those faithful brothers and sisters that are sharing Jesus there and Lord, I thank you that you've let our church be connected with them and that you've now through us, O oh Lord, provided what that church could have really never done on their own. And so I thank you for this. Lord, thank you for every person who's given. Thank you for every person today that's going to feel led to, to be a part even now. I thank you, God, for those who have continued to faithfully uh, support our church. And Lord, thank you for all the lives that are being touched and changed through what you're doing. Lord, we could not have done this without you. We know that you are the source of our supply. 
And God, you have done a miraculous thing. And we've seen it now right in the middle of this time of great stress and great distress, of great uncertainty and economic difficulties. Lord, in the middle of one of the worst economic moments in the life of our country and many of our lifetimes, Lord, you have just done in three weeks a miracle. We give you glory and praise for this. You are an amazing God. And what you have done in providing for the church there in, in Shikapura, Lord, you're going to do continuously do for our church here. You said in your word, give and it shall be given unto you. We're giving to those people there and we're trusting you're going to continue to give to us. Thank you for meeting our needs. Meet the need of everyone watching me right now. Lord, would you bless them? Would you let them find in you the provider, Lord, that they need? May they be filled with peace and filled, O oh Lord, with faith during these difficult days. And we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too. So lay down your heart, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. No who are broken, lift up your face. Lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as 
Well, perhaps you've noticed, but uh, these are some fairly stressful times that, uh, that we're all going through. And as a result of all of the uncertainty and all of the unknown and just the ever-changing environment that we're all living in, people, people are really uh, stressed and, and many, 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 many people are just feeling really emotionally fatigued, emotionally weary. And as a result of that, they just don't have really the energy to... Uh, continue to to just be patient. And so we're seeing people being irritable and impatient and snapping at people and just not really having the common courtesies maybe that they would normally have. And we're seeing a lot of anger, a lot of hostility, and you're really seeing that manifested all over our country right now. Perhaps you're feeling something very similar to that yourself. Maybe you find yourself feeling exhausted today, just emotionally weary over all that's going on. Uh, some of the reasons that we're feeling that way, of course, is just we're, we're seeing an awful lot of change, a lot of just uncertainty, uh, things happening and just, you know, we don't know what's going on. We, we don't know when it's going to get back to any kind of a resemblance of normality. We, you know, just all those things are draining us. And then the hostility that we are confronted with in the news every day, social media. It just, it takes a lot to overcome all of that. And so people are weary and emotionally exhausted. Uh, people are also uh, really confused about what to do. It's draining because we are bombarded every day with just conflicting information. Uh, we don't know what the truth is about, you just pick the subject and we're just bombarded with conflicting data, each claiming to know the truth and just almost any issue and you just have two sides and each passionate about it and, and we don't know what to believe. And so that confusion creates emotional drain on us. In addition to that, people are fearful. They're afraid about what are we going to do uh, financially or am I going to have a job? Is my company going to survive? Uh, is my business going to make it? Is you know, uh, what about my family? Are they going to be healthy or, or am I going to be healthy? And, and there's just so many things. Is school going to start? Are we, our kids going to go to school? Are they going to be online? There's just so many issues that are causing people to be afraid. You know, on, on top of that, um, we've been isolated from our friends and family and our brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the people in our lives that are often the source of encouragement to us, people that are often the positive influences in our lives that uh, bring us good news and encouraging news and lift us up. We've been isolated from many of them. So we're bombarded with this bad news all the time while simultaneously being separated from those who are a source of encouragement. On top of that, we're in a presidential election year. And while that's going on, every time it happens, um, you know, it's just stressful because many of us feel the incredible weight of what is at stake. And we, 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 we sense that, you know, the whole direction of our country is going to be determined in the next, you know, 94 days or whatever it is. And so, you know, we feel the weight of that and we, we hear about that, you know, every day. You know, in addition to that, we, we just, uh, we don't know uh, when things are going to get back to any kind of normality. And then on top of that, we've, we've lost a lot. I mean, many people have suffered great loss. Uh, some of you have lost family members. Some have lost friends that, that me meant a lot to you. Uh, some have, have lost their jobs. Some have lost, you know, opportunities. Some, you know, we've lost our ability to do some of the things that we have wanted to do. We, we can't eat where we want to eat anymore when we want to eat. We, we can't shop where we want to shop. Uh, we can't wear what we want to wear. We, we can't hang out with who we want to hang out with when we want to do it. Uh, we've lost a lot of the things that, that we used to do for fun and as our hobbies. And, you know, suddenly you can't go to a sporting event anymore. Suddenly you can't go to the movies. You can't uh, 
participate in concerts and things that were, were very enjoyable for people. So you add all of that up and much, much more. And what you find is that people are just emotionally exhausted. And the results of that are that we've, many of us lost our peace. We've lost our joy. We've lost a sense of hopefulness and our faith in the goodness of God for the future. Many of us are feeling irritable. We're feeling impatient. We're feeling maybe angry. Many of us are feeling perhaps afraid. Maybe we're feeling discouraged. Maybe we've even gotten dismayed where we don't know what to do. We're paralyzed with indecision. Many of us are feeling, you know, hopeless. Some perhaps are even feeling depressed. And so what do we do when we're in a time like this? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul was going through a time much like this and, and even worse. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, the scripture says this. Paul writes and he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles that we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, great stress, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. He says, I thought we were going to die. Indeed, we felt we had the sentence, received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So Paul says we were under great pressure and great stress. Uh, they, he, he thought they were going to die. And he says they were pushed beyond their own human abilities to handle the situation emotionally. Uh, they were overwhelmed, stressed out. And he said, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but that we might rely upon God. Brothers and sisters, this is just a reminder to you and me today that when we're going through a time like we're going through right now in our world and, our, and in your life, times when we're feeling overwhelmed for all kinds of reasons, these times come, and when they come, we're not to rely on our own selves. This is not a matter of, of you just being tough. It's not a matter of you just getting stronger. It's not a matter of self-determination you know, and willpower. It is a matter of yielding ourselves to God, humbling ourselves and saying, Lord, I need you because I am not sufficient for these things. Lord, I can't handle all of this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to, to go forward. I don't know what the future holds. But you yield yourself completely to the Lord. Paul said, we don't rely on ourselves. We rely on God. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that it describes the fruit of the Spirit. It is talking about what happens in a person's life when we're not relying on ourselves, but we're relying upon the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us. He says in verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, gentleness, and self-control. There are nine virtues there. Nine uh, Christian attributes, nine virtues, Christian qualities, Christ-like qualities that are called the fruit of the Spirit. It's interesting that it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's singular, fruit of the Spirit. Because this is not, these are not nine qualities that somehow you and I are to strive to add to our lives. In other words, he's not giving us a list here where we say, okay, well now this week I'm going to really work at trying to be more loving. And then, you know, next week I'm going to try to be more joyful. And then the next week I'm going to be more at peace. This is not a series of qualities that we try to develop in our lives. These are qualities that the Holy Spirit himself possesses. This is what he's like. He's loving. He's joyful. He's full of peace and all these things. And when he is in control of your life and my life, then these qualities become evidence in us because it's him in us, Jesus Christ in us, 
living his life supernaturally through you so that all nine of these qualities show up when God is in control of our lives. It's sort of like um, nine flavors. It's sort of like if you were to have a, an ice cream sundae that was a strawberry, vanilla, chocolate sundae, and you took a spoon and you got some of all three of those flavors in one bite, and you took that bite and you tasted all three flavors with one bite, that's the same thing this is, except there's nine flavors. And so with one bite, the Holy Spirit lets you experience all nine of these virtues and these, uh, these qualities that uh, really are a description of what God himself is like. And so when we rely upon God, that means I come to God with everything in my life and I rely upon him. I give myself completely to him. If you want to experience the fruit of the Spirit being evidenced in your life, then the only way that that's possible for the Holy Spirit to do that in you and do it through you is for you to yield yourself completely to him. No holding back. Not trying to give him 85% of my life, but I hold out 15% of my life over here. Not giving him 95% of my life, but I got this one little area of my life over here that I want to do what I want to do. It is coming to God and saying, God, I give you my life. I give you my relationships. I give you my future. I give you my finances. I give you my body. I give you my mind. I give you my affections. I, everything that I am, I hand over to you. I want your will to be done in my life. We yield ourselves completely to God. And once you have yielded yourself to Him, we are told in Ephesians 5, 18, it, the scripture says, do not be drunk or controlled with wine, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled there means to be controlled. That, that He takes over your life, that He leads and guides and empowers our lives. And we are commanded in that verse to let Him do that for us. It's in the passive tense there. In other words, we're commanded to let the Spirit of God control our lives. So this is something you and I have to, have to do. We have to let Him. We have to ask Him. We have to rely upon Him. We have to depend upon Him. We have to we have to yield ourselves to Him voluntarily. God will not make you do this. He will not make you follow Him. He's not going to force you to do it. He waits on you and me to come to Him and ask Him to guide and supernaturally empower and lead our lives. But when we do that, He promises that He will. So we need to yield our lives to him because he cannot lead and control what we're controlling. So God, I give myself completely to you. And now I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, you take control of my life. You take control of my future. You take control of my financial situation. You take control of my relationships. Everything I am, I place in your hands. Now you take charge and I will do what you tell me to do. And once you have yielded to him, you've asked him then to fill you and control you, then the last thing is you need to believe that he's done it. Because faith is incredibly important. He commands you and me to be filled with the Spirit. So when we yield ourselves to him and we ask him to, he will do what he has commanded us to do. God would never command us to be filled with the Spirit and then me yield myself and ask him to do what his will is and then for him to say no. So if I sincerely yield myself to him as best I know and ask him to, then the very next moment I will be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. When you do that, the result will be you're not relying on yourself, but you'll be relying upon God and the fruit of the Spirit will be evidenced in your life. And in times of stress, when you can't handle it, you'll find God is more than able to give you victory, give you joy, give you peace, give you guidance, everything you need at just this time like this. So would you bow with me in prayer and let's ask God 
to take control of your life and fill you with his power and with his presence. Father, I pray for us all right now. We are not sufficient in ourselves for these, these times in which we are living. None of us, God, can be like Jesus. We can't do that on our own strength and our own power. And Lord, many of us are feeling today overwhelmed. We're feeling exhausted. And we just really, really need you, God. So I pray for your people right now. I pray that they would make a total yieldedness and commitment of their life to you. And I pray that you would fill your people with your spirit. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the opportunities that we've had over the last several weeks of um, while we were not meeting in person, we're meeting online together. Uh, one of the opportunities, one of the goals that I sort of had was maybe we could use this time to help you get to know the staff of the church uh, a little bit better. So many uh, new people God has brought to us over the last two years, and we've not really uh, had much opportunity sometime for you to get to know the staff up close and personal. So uh, over the next several weeks, uh, I hope to uh, continue to introduce you to the staff. So a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, my dear friend and brother, the executive pastor of our church, Brother Mike Mossberg. And, um, and so we recorded an interview uh, just to give you the opportunity to get to know Mike uh, better. And uh, I know you're going to be blessed by what you hear. So uh, stay tuned and listen to this interview and get to know Mike better and learn some of the lessons uh, that God has done uh, through Mike and Joanne's life. Hi, I'm here today with... Uh, one of my best friends in the whole world and uh, someone who's been an incredible blessing to my life and blessing to our church. And that is my friend, uh, your executive pastor, Mike Mossberg. Mike, welcome to uh, today to uh, come and uh, sit down with us. And I just wanted to give all of our church family and uh, anyone watching this the, um, the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. Our church has grown so much in the last several years. There's a whole lot of new people who have come in who really hadn't had the opportunity to sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one and and uh, Lord willing, there'll be a lot of new folks in the years to come. And uh, so well, thank um, you. anyway, I want to give you this opportunity to uh, get to uh, introduce yourself to our church family. So, uh, so welcome. Thank you. You have uh, been on our church staff now for 18 years as the executive pastor. Actually, about 18 and a half years now, getting no. close to that. Uh, as the executive pastor, you've worn many hats uh, in our church, but that's sort of the umbrella title, I suppose. And, but uh, you and I have laughed about a lot of the things you've done through the years, from unstopping toilets to mopping floors to uh, whole lots of things through the yes. years. So a lot of things yes. come under that title, Executive Pastor. Well, it does. It, it's at the bottom of that uh, job description, what it says in anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I think of how many times you told me that you've walked into the bathroom, looked in the mirror, and delegated the task to that guy you was looking at. <laughs> That's right, to myself. That's right. <laughs> And then tell myself I better get on it. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Well, um, you were already a uh, member of our church, you and uh, Miss Joanne, uh, before you came on our staff. How, how did you find our church? And uh, tell us a little bit okay. about that story. Well, Joanne and I were looking for a church. Uh, we were in another church in Dallas. It was a great church. But uh, virtually all the folks there were 25 years younger than us. And if I invited someone to come to church to join us, they say, how can I find you? And I'd say, look for the only gray hair in the place. And that was me. Um, so we talked to the pastor and told him we were looking and he said, that's fine. And um, we were friends with uh, Nancy and Graham Lyon and Nancy was on staff here. And she knew we were looking for a church and we wanted to find a church that um, believed the Bible was totally inspired and preached it. And she said, well, come here, this guy. Hmm. And so we did. And um, we were here a couple of Sundays, and we knew it, this was the place for us. Hmm. That's, that's the Y'all were members, what, a couple of years? Couple, about two years. Two years? About two years before you joined our staff. And uh, we're going to talk about in a few minutes how you joined our staff. Before you do that, though, give us a little background and tell us about your <laughs> upbringing and, and uh, what God did in um, bringing you to Christ. Well, I grew up uh, in Huntington, West Virginia across the street from a Baptist church. Uh, my brother and sister and I went to church. Our, our parents saw that we went to church. Actually, they probably uh, made us go to church so they could have some peace and quiet on a Sunday morning. Uh, but they weren't churchgoers. Uh, so 
through going to that church somewhere around the age of six or seven, I came to know Christ. Mm. Um, and after that, every time the door was open, I was drawn to the church. And the folks in that church raised me, mm. uh, raised me in the Lord. I, I don't know how many times um, being a little boy there by myself, sitting on a pew that someone didn't flip my hair in the back and tell me to be quiet or pay attention. Um, so I grew up in the church and eventually became a junior deacon. Uh, when I was maybe 11 or 12, they just took me under their wing and, mm. and uh, discipled me and, and saw that I grew up in the Lord. Mm. And just, so neat. Yeah, they were just really great people. So neat. What, what an investment they made. Well, it's just amazing <clears throat> to me when I look back on it that in God's mercy and grace, he just said, I want that little boy next to that church. Mm. That's amazing. And so, I went. So, um, so you felt God calling you to the ministry somewhere along there. Well, that's interesting. From the time I was 8, 9, 10, I felt God was calling me to the ministry. Mm. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I, I went through school and uh, got through high school and decided I was going to go to Moody Bible Institute and went to Moody Bible Institute. Uh, after that, I was going to uh, get an undergraduate degree and then go on to seminary. That was my plan. And through some decisions I made and other circumstances, that just wasn't going to happen. I knew at that point I couldn't be a, a, a pastor in a Baptist church. And so I redirected myself and decided to go in um, into business. And I went into uh, industrial sales. Okay. So, um, so you had many years of, of sales. And uh, what are some of the types of different uh, jobs you had through the years? Well, I started out with uh, Owens, Illinois as a they called it a, uh, just a sales rep, and then I became an account manager. Then I called on folks like Coca-Cola and uh, other large glass users and uh, would sell them glass containers. Um, over the course of the years, I was promoted and, and I wanted to uh, have more responsibility. So over a period probably of 12 years, I moved from being an account manager uh, to a sales manager, to a regional manager, to a vice president of sales. At one point, as the glass container industry constricted and when everything was going plastic, I sat in one chair in Seattle and worked for three different companies. Hmm. As one got bought out by a bigger fish, by a bigger fish. Hmm. And each time I got a different title, uh, I ended up being a general sales manager. Uh, I left that company to become a vice president of sales and marketing for a, a large company on the East Coast. And then I moved from them to become uh, a president and general manager of a packaging company, Vitro Packaging, here in Dallas. So um, somewhere uh, after you were, um, I guess, uh, out of uh, Moody and, and whatever, you met uh, Joanne. So how, how did, tell us a little bit about uh, your love story with Joanne. <clears throat> well, uh, really meeting Joanne changed the course of my life. There's no doubt about it. When uh, I met Joanne, I was um, pretty bitter over not being able to go into ministry. And I was bitter at God and uh, because of the circumstances. And um, I had all kinds of materials and books and I just packed those up and I wasn't going to, I was just done with it. Uh, I met Joanne and um, we met at a company outing. We both worked for Owens, Illinois at the time, uh, about 45 years ago. Wow. And uh, we met in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And I was immediately uh, struck with Joanne. She was not immediately struck with me. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I persisted, and um, six months later, we were married. Wow. And, and we moved uh, then to the West Coast. And uh, when we were on the West Coast in Yakima, Washington, she gave her life to Christ. And I was still sort of bitter. Not sort of bitter, I was bitter. And uh, one afternoon, we were going to this church. She gave her life to ch Christ in a free Methodist church. And the men had an annual uh, camp. They called it a men's advance. And I didn't want anything to do with that. And the men showed up at my house on a Friday and said they were there to pick me up. And I said, well, pick me up for what? And they said, we're all going to camp. 
And I said, well, I'm not packed or anything. And Joanne said, yes, you are. And she had <laughs> packed me up and had a pillow, had everything that I needed. <laughs> and uh, I went to that camp. And through the, uh, the preaching of the guy that they had there, who was a businessman, who gave his life to Christ and was able to use his business and his business experience to further the kingdom, it struck a chord with me. And uh, I, I, at that point, gave my life back to Christ huh. and realized that he hadn't moved away from me. I would left. Hmm. So when I got home, she said, you're different. Hmm. That's amazing. Praise and the Lord. she was right. Hmm. It's interesting, the very uh, next Monday, the pastor of that church came out and he said, you know, it's about time you start doing something for the Lord. He says, I know you have all the answers whenever we ask questions in any of our Sunday school classes. He says, have you ever thought about teaching? And I said, yes. And you would have thought he was going to fall over because <laughs> I, I had nothing to do with that huh. up until then. Wow. Uh, two weeks later, I got a call from a, a, another a pastor who was going to go on vacation and wanted to know if I could fill in. Wow. The Lord started opening doors to serve yeah, him. Yeah, he did. It's wow. pretty neat. That is a neat story. Yeah. So you and Joanne have been married for 45 years. 44 years in August. 44 years. 44 years. Well, praise the Lord. You yeah. got how many children, grandchildren? We have three beautiful uh, daughters, um, and we have, uh, I believe we have 12 grandkids blended and two great-grandchildren. Wow. So your quiver is full, huh? Yes, I'm <laughs> quivering. <laughs> maybe that's what the maybe, maybe that's what the psalmist meant. You know, it, it, it was a mistranslation. <laughs> <laughs> well, fast forward then. Y'all lived on you lived on the west coast. You lived on the east coast. You've lived in um, uh, the Midwest, and uh, then you ended up in the South in Dallas, I guess. We moved Southwest. twelve times. Twelve times. And um, when we moved to Dallas, uh, we sort of felt we were home. We love we love Texas. Love Dallas. And, um, and that was, uh, we were here for a while, uh, and then I took a job and moved away, and then we came back. So when you uh, joined our church then, uh, I guess somewhere around, uh, I guess, 1999 maybe, or something like something that. Something like that. Uh, what position were you holding at that point? At that point, I was president, uh, of, uh, and president of Vitro Packaging here in Dallas. Okay. And that was a large international corporation. Um, it was a large packaging corporation. We were owned by Vitro and Vasas, which is one of the largest uh, manufacturing concerns in Mexico. And I, I ran the sales and marketing effort for that company here in the United States. Okay. You were doing a lot of traveling, in my recollection. It was terrible. I, um, I was the international director. I was on the board of Vitro. Uh, in Vosses, international director. Uh, we tra I traveled uh, all the time. I was into China, Taiwan, the Philippines, uh, into Europe, South America, to Peru. I got to the place where I really hated to travel. And I, I was uh, praying about uh, finding a different kind of job, hopefully in Dallas, where I wouldn't have to leave, um, where I could stop traveling and stop flying. Uh, so I put my resume out to some places in Dallas, but any time I went for an interview, I was really making too much money for anyone to offer me a job. Mm. And uh, we, they said they would love to do it, but they just couldn't do it. Uh, I'd given my resume to a fellow in the church who was with, uh, knew the president of the gas company here in Texas, and um, he thought maybe I'd be something there, but there wasn't. Um, about that time, I got a call from uh, a headhunting um, uh, executive search company in uh, New York, and they were putting together three companies to sell packaging to the cosmetic industry. And I had a lot of experience doing that, and I had several interviews with them, and uh, they were offering me a job, and I was going to go back and meet the board. Um, I remember maybe two weeks before I was going back, I'd ask you to pray with me about it because I didn't want to make a mistake at this point in my life. But if I took that job, my traveling would have dropped down to around 200 mile radius. Mm. And there'd have been no more travel. Mm. And, <clears throat> and Joanne's dad, was, their family was back there. And I thought, 
this might be a good move. And I remember asking you to pray with me about that. Yeah. Well, that, uh, that kind of put a little bit of a bug in my ear because um, at that point, uh, we, this is now, uh, I guess, uh, probably in September of uh, 2001. That's right. And, um, and I remember that uh, events going on in our church and just the needs of our church and whatever, we had come to the point where I knew that we needed help. And uh, so you had uh, come to my mind about uh, maybe you could come and, and help us. And, and of course, I had known, uh, probably through you sharing with me somewhere along the way, that you had felt earlier in life a call to the ministry. And so I, I was hoping that maybe you still felt that. And so, um, so one Sunday, I remember, the, I think it was the week you were going back east to right. meet with the board. Um, I pulled you aside uh, after the service and said, can I talk to you a minute? We had a brief conversation. What do you remember about that, that uh, conversation? Well, that conversation, uh, it was funny in a lot of regard. Uh, you pulled me aside and asked me if I ever thought about being an executive pastor. And I remember looking at you and saying, well, what does an executive pastor do? And you said, uh, I don't know exactly. <laughs> it says, we really don't have the position yet. Then I said, well, what does an executive pastor get paid? And you said, I don't know. We don't have a position, and we really don't have any money. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, this was probably a God moment because you were touching something in my heart from 55 years before. Wow. And I remember looking at you, and I, I don't even remember working my mouth when I said I would think about it. <laughs> you probably thought somebody was sitting around who said yeah, I'm that. Thinking, huh? I think God was back there somehow <laughs> forcing me to do that. And I remember getting in the car and talking to Joanne uh, on the way home. And I said, you know, Glenn asked me the strangest question. And she asked me the same thing. Well, what does he do and what does he get paid? And I said, we don't know. There's no money. And she says, well, how can you say no? Hmm. And I thought, how can I say no? Really easy. It's no. <laughs> and... Uh, and she said, well, I, I said, well, if, if we do this, everything changes. I said, we can't afford a home. Uh, we were, uh, had a um, much larger home than, than we downsized to. And I said, I can't afford the taxes. Uh, you may have to go to work. Um, our lifestyle is going to change. And she says, well, I don't know how you can say no. Hmm. So I went home. We had a daughter living at home with us, told her the same thing. And she said, well, how can you say no? <laughs> and I'm thinking, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> <laughs> um, they don't realize what's going to happen to yeah. if I say yeah. no. And what if I come over here and the church can't make it because I knew we had some financial issues in the church anyway. Right. So, so that, was, um, that was sort of the discussion. And the parting shot from Joanne was, she says, don't let anything having to do with me influence your decision. Don't think if you change this that I will be sad or not provided for, or I can't live the way I want to live, or, I, or I'm upset about having to go to work. It says, don't do that. Hmm. So. so you made your way then to the East Coast uh, for your interview or for your um, meeting was, with the board. Was the, last, uh, was the last meeting, and I pretty much accepted uh, the job in that meeting. Wow. That was on a Monday. And then Tuesday morning, I'm at the airport, I think it was about an 8, maybe an 8.30 flight, 8 o'clock flight, something like that. And we were going down the runway on September the 11th. It was Tuesday. And the pilot, we're, we're taking off, we're speeding up, and all of a sudden he slams the brakes on, and this big plane is doing this, and he pulls off to the side of the runway. And he comes on, I'm sitting in first class, and I can I could hear him talking in there, and he said, uh, he said, there's been an accident at the World Trade Center. Uh, a plane has flown into one of the towers. Hmm. And I'm thinking at that moment, that's really strange because if you're in, I was in and out of New York all the time. You could not fly anywhere near the World Trade Tower. Um, so we're sitting on the side, and then he says, there's been another accident. A second plane has flown into another tower. And he said, all flights are grounded. And we sat there another, a little while longer, and he took that plane and turned it around, went back to the terminal. We, ended up, we came back to the end of the terminal, 
Uh, and as I walked through the terminal to get out of the building, they were closing, bringing the metal gates down on all the shops, and they shut the terminal down. Mm. And I, I was able to find a room in downtown Philadelphia. Mm. And it um, gave me some time to think about this. Yeah. Well, I think you couldn't even get home. You had to rent a car or something to, to drive back. And I um, so I remember uh, as you were driving back, you called me uh, in the car and, uh, and you said something to the effect, I just want you to know that I'm really considering uh, what we talked about. And uh, from the flip side, I'll let you kind of know what was going on on, on my side. Um, of course, you know, the Lord had been, I didn't know if it was the Lord at the time, but I'd been having these thoughts that, um, you know, how much I just sensed that we needed help and, the, and the, uh, that someone with business experience could bring to the church and to help us manage um, not just the finances, but the, the properties, the staff, and, and help us get all on the same page and, and so forth. And so uh, you'd come to my mind. I knew you were considering leaving, and, um, and so I, I knew it was sort of now or never. So that day we had the conversation right after church. And, and so um, what I did was I, uh, I called the chairman of our deacons, Brother Murray Ashwell, and, uh, and I asked if I could meet with him that week. And he came and sat down and said, I want to tell you what I've done. I said, uh, I talked to Mike Mossberg about possibly coming onto our staff as an executive pastor and maybe our educational director. And, and, um, and I said, I just want to let you know that. And, and Murray, godly, godly man, you, what a wonderful yes. man. Um, Murray said, man, I think, I think that's the Lord. So with that, I called um, a couple other guys and kind of talked about it. So we had a deacons meeting scheduled for that week, later toward the end of the week. And so uh, Murray and I decided, he was the chairman of the deacons, that I would present this to the deacons just to see how they might would feel about it. So between that meeting with Murray and the deacons meeting, you called and let me know that you were seriously considering it. So, uh, so I go into the deacons meeting that, that evening, and, um, and I've got a couple little agenda items to talk about, but this is the biggie, is to talk about uh, you coming on our church staff. Well... To, to my uh, disappointment, most of that meeting was talking about how we didn't have any money. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it was like, oh, man, we're running behind the budget and we're offerings are not quite what they need to be. And every week we get a little bit deeper. And now I really don't remember. It seemed like to me we were 30000 behind the budget or 60000 It was something like that. Whatever it was at that moment was a big number to us. And, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, boy, what a terrible environment for me to bring this up and all of a sudden before I said a word one of the men in the room said you know what we really need to help us with this is we need an executive pastor and everybody in the room started nodding their head and Murray and I looked at each other and all of a sudden someone else said you know we need somebody like a Mike Mossberg <laughs> and everybody's going yeah wouldn't that be something and then all of a sudden this gentleman you had given your resume to said, well, I happen to have his resume right here in my briefcase. He opens the briefcase, has about 20 copies of your resume, hands it out to everybody. And everybody is reading your resume and they're shaking their heads. And then they look at me and they go, do you think there's any way in the world he might consider coming on our church staff? <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. I think he might. What a God moment. At that moment in time, those men by faith, said, let's hire him. Let's make him an offer. And, uh, and so uh, it's just an unbelievable thing. What a confirmation from God. And so you and Joanne accepted the role. And uh, when you did so, you had to downsize your house, you had to give up your car, your company car, a uh, whole lot of other things I'm sure that came along with the position. Miss Joanne went back to work and uh, you made a lot, a lot of lifestyle changes and uh, came on our church staff. And that's been over 18 years ago. And I just want to tell you what an incredible gift from God you have been to us. An amazing, oh, thank you. amazing journey. Yeah. So, wow. What are some of the things uh, through the years that um, maybe you've seen God do here in your role as executive pastor that you just like to share with our folks? Well, um, I'd like to back up. Okay, Just, a, just a second. When, um, when we accepted the position, I put a fleece out to God. I wanted to be sure I wasn't going middle-aged crazy or something. <laughs> uh, I felt this was God, and I had confirmation from my family. 
but I wanted it to be unanimous with the deacons. Hmm. Of course, they didn't know that. And the other thing that we needed to do is we had to sell a home after 9-11 by Christmas, uh, and we had to buy one bef- so I could move in and make this, take this job. And I remember asking God to do that, and nothing was selling, nothing was moving uh, in our neighborhood. And, um, and to buy a home in 30 days is a miracle. So when you called, I knew it was unanimous. Uh, we, we started, uh, we put our home on the market. We had a fella come through and offer us 100% cash. Hmm. Amazing. And then we started looking for a home. Now we had the cash. We came across a couple that had bought a home, had, made, had to make payments two months on both the home they built and their home, and they wanted out in 30 days if somebody could cash them. Hmm. So I thought, uh, what a marvelous God we have that not only would give me the desire in my heart to do that, but would give me confirmation. Amen. So after that, we moved on, and uh, I think... Even, into, even to the details, um, in the middle of that, jo- Joanne hadn't worked for years. Uh, and uh, she says, I, I don't have a resume. I, I don't know about finding a job. And a lady that she was in the country club played golf with uh, was a doctor's uh, wife. And she said, I'd like for you to, would you consider coming and being, uh, hmm. working in her office? So she had that got the job. And um, I remember I was concerned uh, that she's, she would go have her hair colored, and that was quite expensive. And uh, we, were, we were really uh, cutting a lot of expenses out. And uh, she went to the guy that had been doing it, and she says, I really like what you do. She says, but I just want to tell you, I'm not going to be here anymore. And she told him why. And uh, he said, well, you just keep right on coming. Hmm. I think he did her hair for 10 years after that. Hmm. Praise the Lord. So even to the small details. Uh, once you get moving, if you accept it and step out in faith, once you get moving for God, He puts the road right under your feet. Right. He provided for you. You took a step of faith. He provided for you all these years. He yeah. provided for the yes. church. We, we hired you when we didn't have a nickel. In fact, we had less <laughs> than nickel. And yet, through the years, God has provided everything that we needed. It's just been an amazing, amazing journey, hasn't it? One of the greatest miracles uh, that I, I was, I can't remember, I was three or four years with the church. We were $90,000 behind. Uh, it was to the place where we weren't going to make our bank note. And I remember preparing a staff reduction plan, and it was me. Hmm. And I came into your office, and I said, um, you know, we may have to cut staff. I think I can still go back into the industry and get a job. And you looked at me and said, um, you think God's done with you here? And I said, well, no. And you said, well, then forget it. So it's never an issue of money with God. The next Tuesday, a guy walked into the church, paid our church off, and caught that debt up. Hmm. Oh, seven hundred thousand dollars he. So after that, I learned that it is never money with God; it's faith and timing. Hmm. Wow. So it's a. Wow. And I've seen it over and over and over again with the church. That's right. Even since we've been out here. We have watched God do so many miracles through the it's years, and, um, and it's just and where we are right now is, is a miracle. And here we are in, in uh, of course, a very unusual time. I don't know when people will be watching the video, but uh, we're in this time of COVID-19 pandemic around the world, and, and our church is not even meeting right now. We're meeting online. We're not meeting in person, and yet God continues to just faithfully, week after week, provide uh, everything yep. we need and more. It's just an amazing God. Anything else you'd like to share with the, with the church family? Well, there's a, there's a lot. Um, just maybe two things. One, uh, we made a decision a number of years ago that we wanted to reach families of young children because that's where the, the, the harvest was ripe. And we tried to do that, and then God gave us the desire of our heart when we moved out here and the academy at Craig Ranch came into existence. And before COVID, we had probably 150 families that were enrolled for different times that we were able to bring in and have a chapel once a week. We were able to teach them about Christ all week long. And uh, I think that uh, that in itself was a tremendous miracle. Um, 
I think one of the things that I've grown to love about our church is that we say we're a family, but we really are family. We don't have a lot of bickering and fighting. Uh, people lay down their own, their own desires and their needs for other people. They meet their needs. I, we had a niece that died tragically when she was 12 years old. And I remember, I hadn't been with the church that long, and uh, one of the ladies in our small group came to me, she and her husband, and said, I don't want you to worry about a thing. Hmm. We're going to take care of all the food. We'll take care of flowers. We'll take care of the arrangements. You don't do anything. Hmm. And she did. And it's a good thing because we were in a fog. And then when I got to the church for the funeral, I didn't know who would show, if, how many people. And the church was full. Hmm. So it, it really is a family. Hmm. Well, Brother Mike, you and uh, Miss Joanne have been here now a little over 18 years. And, you know, I think about how in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that Jesus ascended into heaven and then he gave gifts to men. And then it goes on in verse 11. He says, now those gifts that he's talking about in that particular instance, he says he gives some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. God gives gifted people to the church. And so I want you to know that you are a gift literally from Jesus Christ to me. And you are a gift from God to Brookhaven Church. And when you think about the events of your life, God began as a little boy calling you to himself. And then through all That's those right. years of things that uh, through decisions and through things that happen, events beyond your control, uh, you went in a different path in the business world, but God used every bit of that to equip you for this such a time as this. And you have been given by Jesus to be a gift from God to us. And just as God orchestrated the events of your life for good, so it is that anybody watching this today, they can take away from your life and testimony that, uh, that it's, it's never too late to serve the Lord. That's right. And uh, that God knows what he's doing. God will use even the bad things in life and, and bring good from it. And, uh, and that he will provide if they'll just step out in faith and follow him. So, brother, I want to tell you, you're one of the greatest things God's ever done for me is giving thank us you. you. So thank, thank you. you for sharing, taking the time to share with us today. Thank you. Well, I am so grateful for Mike and Joanne Mossberg that God brought them to be a part of our church family. They've been an immense blessing to our church and to my life, and I'm so grateful for them. All of us uh, watching today and, and who will watch this in the future, uh, Mike and Joanne are a wonderful example of how God can use the experiences of your life, and He can use it to bring about uh, His purposes uh, through your life. God never wastes an experience, and God wants to use uh, everything about your past to help you uh, be fruitful uh, in your future. And they're also a testimony of how God will provide. You follow God. Just obey God. Follow Him, whatever He's leading you to do, and God will take care of you. And so until next week, uh, God bless you, and uh, looking forward to seeing you again in person very, very soon.